everyone's favorite video game review show. An all new game view starts right now. Hey guys, it's Scott. Tonight on GameView, it's the final installment in our series about the train wreck that was Paper Mario Color Splash. The last time we talked about this game was over six months ago. Well, the game has now been out for over two months, even longer when you consider that mistake Nintendo made releasing the game digitally two weeks before its release date, and we're finally starting to get some sales figures in. So we're going to take a look at that, and I'm also going to give you my final thoughts on the game. I've played through it from start to finish, and uh, it's a little better than I thought it was, but I'm still highly disappointed by the Intelligent Systems team. And Kensuke Tanabe. We'll get to him later on. Okay, so the first thing we're going to start off with is the figures. Uh, these are the most important indicator on the success or failure of a game. Usually when a company boasts their sales figures to the public, whether it's a press release or a public event of some sort, it's because the game or the product is doing extremely well. Look at all the PRs that have been released on Pokemon Sun and Moon recently. Obviously, a lot of people, millions across the globe, have bought Sun and Moon, have even pre-ordered Sun and Moon. So Nintendo is clearly quite happy about that. On the other hand, you take a game like Paper Mario Color Splash, and Nintendo's been relatively quiet uh, when it comes to the sales figures. They haven't put out any press releases, they haven't really talked about the game aside from the occasional interview that's been leaked on one of these various sites, uh, such as Game Informer. Uh, so to preface this, I want to go back 16 years and I've been taking a look at these numbers provided by Nintendo Life and VG Charts, and uh, I just want to give you a bit of an introduction to how well the previous Paper Mario games have done. Uh, now, again, keep in mind I don't have all of the sales figures available, uh, but based off what we do have, well, I think it's safe to say that the sales speak for themselves. Anyway, so let's get started. First, I'm going to talk about the sales for Paper Mario entries in Japan. The first Paper Mario on the N64, the first week of sales, it sold 118,322 copies. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, First week of sales, 137,750 copies. Super Paper Mario. First week, 156,055 copies. Now, if you notice a pattern here, the numbers keep going up, right? Then we hit Paper Mario Sticker Star. First week, 130,009 copies. That's a drop of about 26,000. And then, finally, we get to Paper Mario Color Splash. First week sales in Japan, 20,894. And no, this is not a joke. We went from a series that started at 118,000 and continued to climb through the subsequent releases of Thousand Year Door and Super Paper Mario, but as soon as Sticker Star came out in 2012, that's when the sales started to decline and really crash and burn would be the appropriate term uh, when Color Splash was released. Uh, sort of like a stock market crash. Maybe not as bad as the one that happened in 1929, but uh, no doubt Nintendo's not happy with those figures. Now, here's where you're gonna say, but wait, Scott, first week sales are not indicative of a game's total performance. And you know what? You're right. So a more accurate way to take a look at this 
would be to see how many copies of a game sold throughout the lifetime of that game's release and divide that by the number of people who bought the console the game was released on. We get a percentage that tells us roughly how many people who bought the console also spent the extra money on the game. For the first Paper Mario, again, these are Japanese figures, the lifetime sales for the N64 version were 425,609 copies. Roughly 5,540,000 people in Japan bought the N64 console itself. Therefore, we give Paper Mario an attachment rate of 7.68%. So roughly 7% of everyone in Japan who bought an N64 also bought the original Paper Mario. Then we take a look at the Thousand Year Door. Lifetime sales actually went down slightly, 409,600. But the install base, the number of people who bought GameCubes, also went down, 4,040,000. So, the attachment rate actually went up. 10% of all GameCube owners in Japan bought the Thousand Year Door. Improvement. Next entry, Super Paper Mario. Now, you have to remember, Super Paper Mario came out on the highly successful Wii platform. That being said, lifetime sales, 506,298, roughly 12,750,000 Wii systems were sold in Japan. That gives Super Paper Mario an attachment rate of 3.97%. Huge drop from the Thousand Year Door, but that's to be expected. The Wii was a more casual system, aimed more at casual gamers and families. Here's where things get interesting. Paper Mario Sticker Star continued to see a drop in the attachment rate. 564,823 copies sold. 21,320,000 people bought the 3DS. That gives Paper Mario Sticker Star an attachment rate of just 2.65%. Even though more consoles are being sold, whether they're a handheld console or a home-based console, even though more consoles are being sold, the number of people buying Paper Mario games is not increasing. In fact, it's either staying the same or it's decreasing through subsequent entries. That's not good. Now, of course, the last entry we have to talk about is Paper Mario Color Splash. Now, again, we haven't gotten through the lifetime of this game, which, let's be honest, is probably going to be pretty short because the Wii U is coming up to a very quick and decisive end as the Switch nears its release. But if we take an estimate based off the other sales figures that we've seen, we can calculate that the lifetime sales for Color Splash in Japan will be anywhere from roughly 60,000 to about 86, 87,000. And of course, the install base, number of people who bought a Wii U, roughly 3.2 million. So, based off of that, we can say that the attachment rate for Color Splash will be somewhere between 1.95% and roughly 2.68%. So, basically what this means is, at best, Color Splash matches Sticker Star's level of attachment rate. At worst, it's actually the lowest selling Paper Mario game out of all five entries. And I say five because technically I'm not including Paper Jam since it's more of a Mario and Luigi game. That is definitely not a good thing. Now, some other figures I want to point out. 
Uh, North American first week sales in the U.S. Super Paper Mario first week U.S. sales 140,297. For Paper Mario Sticker Star, 148,884. So as you can see, roughly equal. And then we get to Color Splash, and it drops. 49,910. Now, there are one of two ways you can look at this. You can say, well, okay, that's great. Color Splash sold nearly twice as many copies in the U.S. in its first week than it did in Japan. However, the more realistic perspective is to look at it from the point of view that Color Splash sold nearly 100,000 copies less in its first week than Sticker Star did. And that is not good. That is not good at all. That is an epic fail. And when we look at Europe sales, they weren't much better. Uh, first week sales in Europe, roughly 21,000. Uh, from what I remember reading, I think it came in roughly 15th or 16th place in terms of video game sales for that week. Uh, and then it continued to drop. I think the second or third week, I don't even believe Color Splash made the top 30 or maybe even the top 40. Uh, in terms of Europe's video games. So, the general consensus here is that whether it's the US, Europe, Japan, Color Splash's sales have not been very good at all. In fact, they've been an absolute disaster, even when compared against Sticker Star that came out four years earlier. So, I guess, uh, the summary is that uh, people played Sticker Star and either they didn't like it or not enough people were interested in buying Color Splash because it looked so similar to Sticker Star. There's also one more point I want to address because someone out there is going to bring this up. They're going to say, Scott, that's not a fair comparison because the Wii U is not selling well. In fact, the Wii U has sold less units than any previous Nintendo home console to date. Also, Color Splash is releasing at the end of the Wii U's lifespan. So naturally, there's going to be a low install base. And you know what? You are 100% right. But again, that's why we calculate the attachment rate. We take the number of people who bought the game, compare it to the number of people who bought the console, and that percentage tells us how well the game has done. And not to be a broken record, but when the attachment rate has gone up from 7%, to 10%, then plummeted to 3%, because, let's face it, more people were buying casual games like Wii Sports than they were the hardcore games like Super Mario Galaxy and Super Smash Bros. Brawl on the Wii, uh, to then continuing to fall to 2%, for Sticker Star, and the very high chance that it could barely hit 2% for Color Splash, that kind of tells us that the series has been on a general downward trend. And whether that's because of the fact that the games have not been in the turn-based JRPG style since 2004, or because of the fact that uh, they've strayed away from using original characters. I mean, you can create any excuse you want. You can debate it ad nauseum. We've already gone over all the details, so I won't bore you with them again. But from a sales perspective, Super Paper Mario had the highest first week sales of all the Paper Mario games. And Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door had the highest attachment rate of all the Paper Mario games. That was almost a decade ago, folks. That's some sad stuff. Clearly, not many people are happy about the direction the Paper Mario series has taken. And despite Sticker Star doing relatively well, 
and both Sticker Star and Color Splash getting scores in the 7s and 8s from places like IGN and GameSpot. Um, I think it's obvious what the fans want, and it's based off of these sales results. The next thing I want to talk about is a recent interview Game Informer had with Kensuke Tanabe, the producer of Color Splash. Now, if you think you've heard his name before, chances are you actually have. I did some research and I found out some interesting things about this guy. Apparently, he was a screenplay advisor for Super Mario RPG. He was, of course, the producer of the Metroid Prime series. He was the producer of Paper Mario Sticker Star, the supervisor of Mario and Luigi Paper Jam, the producer of the much-hated Metroid Prime Federation Force, and now, like I said, the producer of Paper Mario Color Splash. And, more innocuously, he was also responsible for Chibi Robo Ziplash, another game that uh, angered its fan base, to say the very least. So, Game Informer asked Tanabe about two things in particular. The fact that Paper Mario continues to move away from its turn-based JRPG roots, and the fact that Intelligent Systems refuses to add original characters into the Paper Mario games. And this is what Tanabe had to say. Quote, Mario is not an IP that I created. From the position of someone borrowing the IP, I think it's only natural to show respect to the person who created it, and let that feeling of respect guide us. When Miyamoto-san, the father of Mario, asks us, could you make a game with only characters from the Mario family, I think it's only natural for us to give it our best shot. In other words, we are not currently thinking about returning to old NPCs. Incidentally, I do think Color Splash may have proven that we can still make a game entertaining even if our original characters don't appear as NPCs, and with that belief, we will keep on continuing to do our best." End quote. Game Informer then went further and specifically asked Tanabe if he would bring back companion characters with their own abilities in the future. And here's what Tanabe said on that. Quote, Personally, I don't give much thought to how we are leaving old methods behind in any series, not just Paper Mario. I always prioritize thinking about how we can build new methods and new elements. Of course, there were some series where we have not made big changes to the systems, but sometimes that's because we feel as though these systems haven't been perfected yet, or the gameplay can be expanded even further. We felt both of those things in Color Splash. However, I do feel as though we reached the end of where Color Splash is headed. So if we get the chance to continue the series, I think we'll want to create a Paper Mario with a different system." End quote. Now, there are a few interesting things I want to point out about this interview. First, a few days after it was posted on Game Informer's website, it was taken down in its entirety. So, either Tanabe himself, or Intelligent Systems, or maybe even Nintendo, weren't happy with this discussion going public. Probably because the game hasn't even been out for three months. So, they probably asked Game Informer to take it down. Fortunately, other websites like My Nintendo News and Nintendo Everything copied the interview and pasted it on their own sites. So, it's still available to the public. But, it just goes to show you that, clearly, they want to keep the poor sales and the negative reactions to this game away from the public as much as possible, because, as you know, with any company, they like to only talk about the positives and try to hide the negatives away from public view. The other thing I wanted to point out, as much hate as Risa Tabata gets for the direction this game has taken, and I'm guilty for this as well, 
I think it's safe to say that much of that hate is misplaced, and for the most part, Tanabe is the one responsible for this item-based battle system and lack of original characters. Because, to me anyway, and I could be wrong, but it seems like Risa Tabata was Nintendo's PR person. She was the one who wanted to be shown in the public light advertising this game. And, of course, when that happens, it's only natural that people then blame her for the reason the game is what it is. But Tanabe is the main producer. Regardless of how you feel about Miyamoto telling Tanabe to only use characters from the Mario universe, Tanabe is ultimately the producer of this game. The buck stops with him. Tanabe has to be the one to stand up for his team and say to Miyamoto, Sir, I respect you, but this is not what the fans want. This is not what the Paper Mario series is about. Remember, Miyamoto isn't even involved with Color Splash. He's not producing it, he's not directing it, he's not even developing it. Tanabe is the boss, he's the producer, he's the guy telling the rest of his team at Intelligence Systems what to do, and he's the one responsible for straying from the original formula, for not listening to the fans, and putting in original characters. What he thinks he's doing out of respect for Miyamoto is actually hurting the franchise in the long run, and you can see that with the numerous negative comments from the fans, and you can see that from the extraordinarily low sales figure. It reminds me of when something similar happened back in 2012-2013 when Miyamoto told the exact same thing to Alpha Dream, the company responsible for the Mario and Luigi franchise. Miyamoto told them only use characters from the Mario universe in Dream Team. And Alpha Dream had the guts to actually stand up to him and say, we understand what you're feeling, however, no, we are not going to restrict ourselves to only using characters in the Mario universe. And that's what it takes. It takes someone who has the backbone to stand up and say, no, you're not developing this game, we are, we know what the fans want, therefore, we respect your opinion, but we are not going to abide by it. And unfortunately, Intelligent Systems and Tanabe just does not have the backbone to say no to Miyamoto. So, whether we get another Paper Mario installment or not, only time will tell. I don't think Nintendo will kill off the franchise. We'll probably get another Paper Mario on the Nintendo Switch in about three, four years from now. But my biggest fear is that the next Paper Mario will not only continue to alienate traditional Paper Mario fans, but it will also alienate the Sticker Star and Color Splash fans. Because the two biggest takeaways out of this interview are that Tanabe still refuses to include original characters and original character designs, and they've pretty much maxed out what they think they can do with the Sticker Star and Color Splash battle system, so the next Paper Mario will have, yet again, a completely different battle system. So, whether that battle system is better or worse than the one we got in Color Splash, who's to know, but it will be a completely different battle system nonetheless. So, unfortunately, the next Paper Mario on the Switch will still have hundreds of Toads and hundreds of Shy Guys again, because Tanabe refuses to allow his team to create original characters and original designs, even though they are perfectly more than capable of doing so. And uh, not only that, but it's probably going to be another non-EXP-based battle system. 
I could be wrong, I hope I am, but based off of what he said in that interview, it sounds like he hasn't listened to a single word that the fans have been saying since Color Splash was first announced back in March. Or he has seen the comments, he has listened to the fans, but he's explicitly choosing to ignore them. Either of which is not good. And I still stand by what I said back in July. Kensuke Tanabe should be fired, or at the very least, moved off of the Paper Mario development team, and considering what happened with Federation Force, he should probably move away from Metroid as well. And uh, Risa Tabata should be fired as well. I know it's mostly not her fault, because she's just acting like a PR person in public view, uh, saying the same things Tanabe probably told her to say, but someone at that company has to stand up and, like I said, have a backbone and say to them, whoever's in charge, this is what the fans want, this is why the sales are not strong, and we want to try a different direction. We want to try listening to the fans, listening to their feedback, implementing it into the game, and then, if the sales continue a downward spiral, then it's fair to try a new direction for the series, or just end the series altogether. But if you continue down this path of not listening to what the fans want, the sales will reflect that. I'm going to end this episode by talking about my experience with Paper Mario Color Splash. I got my fair share of criticism from commentators saying, Oh, Scott, you didn't buy the game yet. You didn't play through it. You don't have the right to criticize. It could be a lot better than you think it is. So you know what? I pre-ordered the game. I wasted $85 because, yes, it is $85 after tax over here and I played through it and here's what I have to say about it was it as bad as I thought it was going to be no but all the criticisms I had about color splash from the moment I saw the first one minute trailer back in March were actually accurate and they were true 100% the graphics were phenomenal. I know some people are criticizing the way it looks, being too papery, uh, but I didn't have any problem with that. The music, very addictive. I actually found myself getting into every single wild battle I could just because I wanted to listen to the music. Uh, the humor was spot on. Uh, the humor, in fact, actually reminded me of how funny the original Paper Mario games used to be. And uh, aside from that, um, as far as the length of the game is concerned, it actually took me just as long to beat Color Splash as it did to beat the original Thousand Year Door and Super Paper Mario. You would think that the game would actually be shorter because it only has six big paint stars instead of eight, which is usually typical of a Paper Mario adventure, but uh, probably because I was collecting everything and battling every wild enemy, that's why it took just as long. As far as the negative points of this game, they actually stood out to me just as much as the positives, and that's the one thing you never want to be the case for any video game. The lack of original characters. Yes, we got some enemies that were never part of any previous Paper Mario game, like the Dino Rhinos and the Bone Goombas, but they were still part of the Mario family. And aside from those two, I can't really think of any other character that really stood out to me. Maybe Drudigan, or Dragadon. I like to call him Drudigan. But it's pretty obvious to see the lack of originality and the lack of original characters in this game. In the Port Prisma Museum, where you can collect enemy cards and put them on public display, there are 72 different enemies. Of the 72 enemies, 
at least half of them are just different versions of Shy Guys, or Shy Guys in different colors. You've got five different colors of regular Shy Guys, then you've got Slurp Guys, then you've got Spike Guys, then you've got Roller Guys, then you've got the Shy Bandits, then you have Sniffets, which are essentially Shy Guys with masks, then you've got Slurp Sniffets, then you've got Spike Sniffets, uh, I mean, this is the insanity that is Color Splash. So, what can I tell you? I, the lack of originality is pretty evident. I also noticed some other things while I was playing Color Splash as well. The fact that in previous Paper Mario games, like the original, where you could spin dash in the overworld, or in Thousand Year Door, where you could jump on the back of Yoshi in order to run around faster, or even in Super Paper Mario, where Mario could jump on the back of Carrie to increase his movement speed. Well, in Color Splash, I was wondering why it seemed like it was taking longer for me to get Mario from point A to point B. Well, that's because there is no way to run or dash with Mario. You're just walking. So that's something I noticed. And uh, of course, the battle system. My biggest gripe was the battle system, as you know, is the lack of experience. I've said it before, but I specifically got into every wild enemy battle that I could because not only did I like the music but I want to make a point about how bad this battle system was because of the fact that you can only carry 99 cards the fact that at least six or seven have to be the thing cards that you need for that particular section of the map and because of the fact that generally you need to use at least two to three cards per battle, whether you're wasting them or not, I was actually running out of cards more often than I ran out of paint. Because I would get into a battle, there would be easily 20 or 30 enemies in a level, and of course, being the person, the completionist type of person that I am, I would get into every single wild enemy battle in that level so 30 enemies in the level two three cards used in each enemy battle there goes 90 cards and your limit is 99 right uh, i also found it frustrating when i would get into battles against dry bones because as you guys may remember in previous paper mario entries dry bones were weak to fire type attacks well for some reason, in Color Splash, Dry Bones are immune to Fire-type attacks. In fact, the only way you can actually get rid of Dry Bones is in the overworld. If there happens to be, like, a, a cardboard plank in the overworld, you knock the plank over while the Dry Bones is standing in front of it, and that's how you eliminate them. But there were many areas, like in the Parallel World, sorry, spoilers, but uh, there were many areas, like in the parallel world, where there weren't any overworld objects to eliminate the dry bones with. So I would get into a battle with the dry bones, there was no way I could permanently defeat it, and 10-20 seconds later after the battle ends, I would end up in the exact same battle against that exact same dry bones enemy again, because there's no way to knock it out, and uh, it respawned automatically. So that was frustrating. The fact that the targeting mechanics are basically non-existent in Color Splash. The fact that it auto-targets every enemy based on the card slot. Uh, that was annoying. Another thing that I hate about this battle system is the way they chose to implement partners and the enemy card concept. It's bad enough that each partner only lasts for that specific battle that you're in. But to go further and say no partners will work in mini boss or boss fights, that's a questionable decision in my mind. Because think about it, what is 
the best way to encourage the player to actually participate in wild battles. Well, aside from leveling up your paint meter, it would be collecting enemy cards, collecting allies that you could save and use for those tougher boss fights. But I don't know whose bright idea it was at Intelligence Systems to decide, oh, Mario would be overpowered if he actually had a partner in a boss fight, so we're not going to let him have one. But that guy should get kicked to the curb. It's really annoying. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to enter a boss fight with a Dino Rhino, with a Pokey, with uh, a, one of the Koopalings, even, and actually have that partner available, even if it wasn't able to do much damage, just to be able to take damage instead of Mario being the only one in the battle and having all the attacks focused on him. But because of the way they implemented this partner system, where you can only collect partners in wild battles, and you can only use partners in wild battles, it defeats the point. And uh, most importantly, the lack of an EXP system. I think by the end of the game, I probably had the highest paint meter, or one of the highest paint meters anyone has ever had, because of the fact that I constantly battled every enemy, sometimes multiple times if I had to leave the level and then come back again, my paint meter at the end of Color Splash was 550 units. And by then, every time I leveled it up, it was only going up by 5. Like, 530, 535, 540, 545. And uh, even when I used a big fire flower, or a big ice flower, uh, which consisted of most of my cards, let's be honest, I mean, <laughs> most of my inventory was like 30 iron jumps, 30 fire flowers, and a couple of ice flowers, just to get around the enemies that were immune to fire, like the dry bones. Um, but uh, I had to actually buy the fully colored version of those cards, because if I bought the non-colored version, yes it was cheaper, but I would still end up using about 240-250 units of paint just to fully paint the card. So even at 500 units, half my paint gauge was eliminated just by painting one fire flower or one big ice flower. So. I basically just farmed coins at Rochambeau temples, and, uh, oh, by the way, uh, the Toad, who is the uh, Rochambeau master at each of the temples, it's basically just a Toad wearing a glove hat at the end, he, he takes off his glove hat and reveals he's just a regular red and white Toad, but, uh, I farmed coins at the Rochambeau temples, got up to 9,999, then spent all my money on big ice flowers, big fire flowers, big iron jumps, and that was basically my inventory. Uh, and of course the last thing I'll have to point out is the story, which is basically non-existent. It was, I'll admit, kind of cool uh, that they did make references in the game to the Luigi death stare, the fact that Luigi shows up at the end with his cart from Mario Kart 8 and the Mario Kart 8 theme song plays, the fact that there are so many nostalgic references throughout the game, um, like I said, it was pretty neat in that regards, but the actual story, again, spoilers, is very basic and very boring. For those of you who don't know by now, Bowser jumps into the Prisma Fountain. He spins around trying to swirl the colors together. That's how the black paint is made. And the black paint absorbs Bowser and possesses him. And basically, the final battle of the game, uh, all it comes down to is nailing the defensive action timing, because Bowser attacks Mario, if you time the defensive action command correctly, then you suck all the black paint away from Bowser, 
castle crumbles, end of the story. And that's basically it. So, it's not really a story. In fact, I would tend to argue that it was actually worse of a story than the original N64 Paper Mario, because, at least in the original Paper Mario, Bowser was funnier, and I think that was always part of the charm for me. Bowser was the comic relief in the games, whereas in Sticker Star and Color Splash, he's less comical, he's less funny, and he's more of, oh, I'm the big bad guy, and I'm going to overpower Mario. So, but even in the original games, uh, just that that comedy that has always been associated with Bowser, even though it was just a blatant, oh, I stole the Star Rod, I became almighty and all-powerful, I still prefer that over what they did in Sticker Star and Color Splash. Anyway, that's my look on the game. Still sticking to my score of 4 out of 10, because yes, it was slightly more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be, mainly because of the humor and the writing and the music, but that lack of originality, boring story, and that god-awful battle system, it, it just killed it for me. When I look at a Paper Mario game, I look at if it can stand the test of time, and Color Splash, once I'm done collecting the cards in the Prisma Museum, I don't see myself playing it again. I really don't. Because, at least with the original Paper Mario, and even with Thousand Year Door, there were reasons to play it again. You could decide if you want to do an all HP run, or an all FP run, or an all BP run. There were different choices for the player to take as they were playing through the game, and those choices affected how hard or how easy the game was. In Color Splash, everything seems way too easy, and the player isn't given the choice to take a different route. If I played through the game again, I would still find myself using iron jumps. I would still find myself using fire flowers, because if Kamek turned all of my cards into regular jump cards against spiky enemies, or regular hammer cards against flying enemies, well, iron jump is your best defense against that. So, I'd still find myself using the exact same cards over and over again if I played Color Splash a second, a third, or a fourth time. So, actually, what I'm more looking forward to is playing Thousand Year Door again on the Switch. I will spend that 20 bucks or that 30 bucks to buy Thousand Year Door again, because at this point, I think it's almost inevitable. We all know that the Switch has analog triggers, that it will have GameCube games in the Virtual Console. And uh, I'm looking forward to playing Thousand Year Door again. That way I don't have to drag out my GameCube in order to do it. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. So what do you guys think? Have you decided that you actually wanted to play Color Splash? Did you already buy the game? Heck, did you even beat the game? Was it better than you thought? Was it worse than you thought? Was it the same? Exactly like you thought it was going to be based off of the March reveal. I'd love to know. Let us know your thoughts and comments. Make sure to follow us on all social media at Toon Dice and hashtag GameView. Don't forget to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Toon Dice. And until next time, I'm Scott. I'll see you later.